We welcome you to Grace this morning, uh, Grace Virtual Church, and uh, I have a couple announcements to make, and uh, we won't be having any services for uh, the foreseeable future uh, until uh, we get cleared from, from this virus. Now, if you're following along in your uh, worship guide, if you have uh, the text there, uh, you need to uh, hit the link if you want to uh, follow along and and it's underlined in blue in the worship guide for you to uh, get to the hymns and, and other things that we have. Uh, we appreciate all the offerings that have come in uh, up, to, up to this point, and we thank you for keeping up with your pledges. Uh, other than that, I don't have any other announcements at this time, uh, but if you have any announcements that you need to pass along to us, uh, please uh, let uh, Toby or somebody else know uh, that we need to make any announcements. Thank you very much. Our call to worship today is Psalm 15. Psalm 15 is a psalm of David. It's a psalm concerning the righteous man. So hear now this call to worship. Psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be moved. In this psalm, we see a righteous person being described and a truly righteous person is one who fulfills not just one of these, but all of these. And as we move through these, the question is answered Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? And truly, if we are honest with ourselves, we recognize that we don't fit this description perfectly. There's only one who perfectly fits this description, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous man. We do not come today touting our own strength. We do not come bragging or even speaking of our own perfections. We have come today to lift up the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the one who always spoke the truth, the one who was the truth, the one who even swore to his own hurt. He is the one who never changed his mind. He followed the Lord's will for him perfectly all the way through to the cross. And we come today to celebrate him, to lift up his name and to tell of his excellent greatness. And so let's do that now with hymn number 106, Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus, Our Blessed Redeemer. Let's stand, if you're able, wherever you are, to sing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, Our Blessed Redeemer, sing of angels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, 
Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. Holy Spirit, we worship you, giving you thanks and praise, almighty and most wonderful, most glorious, most holy triune God. We come to you this morning through Jesus Christ. We come to you because of him and for him. Because of him, for he indeed is our blessed redeemer. And we would sing, praise the Lord this morning. Praise him with joyful song. Indeed, you have made us joyful because of the salvation which you have purchased for us on the cross. We give you thanks and praise for the way that you have redeemed us. Your Holy Spirit who applies this redemption to our hearts. Your word, which is your truth which you have made to resonate in our hearts and to grow in our hearts. And so we come to you, almighty God, this morning, sing the praises of our blessed Redeemer. We are so grateful to you for the way in which you are at work today. We know that you are always at work. And we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to go somewhere else to find you. We can find you right where we are. We thank you, Lord, that you are present where two or three are gathered in your name, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you are there with those who gather. So thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for the way in which you are ruling and reigning over all things right now. We don't have to go to Washington, D.C. We don't have to go to the United Nations. We don't have to go to some other country to come to the center of all that is. We are there right now because we are in your presence. We are before your throne. You are ruling right now over all things. All things are ordered according to your plan. You are sending forth your holy angels to do your bidding. And Lord, we would seek your face today and we would exalt you as the truly righteous one. And so Lord, in our need for you today, would you meet us where we are and grant us the blessing of your presence and fuel us with your strength and your joy, your glory and your love that we might go forth as ambassadors of your kingdom to speak and to tell of your excellent greatness. Not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory today and always. And so it's for this kingdom that you have made us your ambassadors. It is to our king that we pray, and it is for his kingdom's expansion that we now lift up our voices and pray now together the prayer that our Lord Jesus himself taught us to pray. In the Lord's Prayer, we lift up our voices and pray together saying now, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We take this opportunity now to lift up our voices together. We confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed this morning. It is printed on your worship guide. If you would follow along with me as we confess our faith together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. You may be seated as you are able wherever you are. We come to our time this morning uh, for our confession of sin and in the Heidelberg Catechism, it's the Lord's Day, uh, number 42. Uh, It is appropriate for today uh, because of uh, what's going on with our uh, dealing with the virus and the stay at home orders that we have. Uh, What I'd like to go through with you here is uh, how we do that with the question and answer, which is number 110. It says question. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes all scheming and swindling in order to get our neighbor's goods for ourselves, whether by force or means that appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weight, size, or volume, fraudulent merchandising, counterfeit money or excessive interest, or any other means forbidden by God. In addition, God forbids all greed and pointless squandering of his gifts. In question number 111 and answer, question, what does God require of you in this commandment? Answer, that I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good that I treat others as I would like them to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you and ask the Lord that you would uh, forgive us, Lord, when we, when we do these things. Uh, Lord, we are called not to, not to squander things. We are called not to... Uh, uh, take advantage of uh, the situation. Uh, we see uh, people doing that, Lord, of either charging excessive prices for things or uh, hoarding things. Lord, we don't want to do that as believers. We definitely uh, would not be a good example and a good witness of you in doing that. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would uh, forgive us, Lord, when we are not neighborly uh, during this time when uh, nerves are frayed and, and uh, we uh, see some of the freedoms that we have so enjoyed uh, being taken away. Lord, uh, it's very easy to, to lash out and to, and to do things, Lord, that we shouldn't. And Lord, so we ask, Lord, that you would uh, forgive us for those times when we, when we might be short with people or, or other things. Acknowledge, Lord, that we are to be the people that you want us to be here in this community during this time. We see great opportunities, Lord, for a witness, and our witness needs to be good. 
and holy and able to, to bring others to know you through the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask, Lord, that you would anoint this time, Lord, as we confess these things to you. And the Lord is gracious, free to give to those that acknowledge him. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to our assurance of pardon this morning, and it comes to us from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, where it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. As we come to our time in our service this morning uh, to pray for others and uh, the situation we have going on around us, I'd like to encourage you and uh, especially to, uh, with this communication that we don't have on a personal level to, to let me know if you have other prayer needs, uh, praises and things. I do the prayer list each week and uh, appreciate if you do that. So let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we we acknowledge you. We, we worship you, Lord, here this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint us, Lord, with your, with your grace, uh, with your presence with us this morning. Uh, Lord, each week we are uh, called to gather. Lord, and whether that's in our homes or here in the sanctuary, Lord, we, we gather, Lord, to, to bring our praises and our acknowledgement of you. And Lord, as we have confessed before, Lord, uh, we don't want to neglect our neighbors. And Lord, help us to to reach out to them and and help them through this time. Uh, We see some great things happening uh, with uh, people getting back with their families and and other things, Lord, that has caused us, Lord, to to really reflect, Lord, on on, on your presence with us. And Lord, we thank you. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for protecting us from harm to this point. Lord, there's only one case uh, in this county at the present time, uh, as this is being recorded, that 
that we uh, have in this county, and we are so grateful, Lord, that that is uh, the case. Uh, Lord, that, but there are many others, Lord, that are suffering, uh, especially in New York and, and other areas of the country where uh, the disease is, is going uh, rampant and, and escalating. Uh, people are, are succumbing to this uh, horrible virus. Lord, it is in your providence, Lord, that we uh, depend on you uh, to protect us, Lord. And we thank you so much for your protection to this point. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, reach out and touch those that are taking care of those that are sick, uh, especially uh, uh, groups like Samaritan's Purse and, and other doctors and medical uh, personnel that are putting themselves on the front line in, in, in the path of kind of a danger, Lord, of, of uh, taking care of these people that, are, that are, are getting sick. We ask your provision for them. We ask for uh, guidance for them and for your protection of them. Uh, help us all, Lord, to, to not to do the things that uh, would uh, uh, negatively impact our medical services that we have, uh, because it can get overwhelmed, Lord, if we don't observe uh, these uh, guidelines that have been placed before us. Help us all to, to reach out to our neighbors uh, with reasonable uh, actions. Lord, that is what you've called us to do. And I ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, Lord, in, in how we do that. Lord, yes, we have to keep our distance, but Lord, it doesn't mean that we can't uh, continue to pray, continue to, to reach out to those that have needs. Help us to gather the things that we need to help others, uh, the food and, and other supplies that might be necessary for this. Lord, we ask that you'd be with uh, our, our leaders as they guide us through this process. And Lord, that uh, you would give them wisdom, strength, and endurance. Lord, that has caused a lot of anxiety in our country, uh, not just uh, physically and um, spiritually and emotionally, Lord, but even economically, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those that are, are taking care of us in that ma manner. Lord, that we would use the resources you've been given. You've given it to us, Lord, to, to be uh, good stewards of them. Lord, we thank you that you pr promise to, to hold us in your hand every moment of every day. And Lord, we just ask that you do that, not only today, but throughout this week. We pray that all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today in our sermon series, we come to the last half or so of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel is speeding us on quickly toward the cross. And we find in today's section, we find a number of different characters in the dialogue, the way that Mark is putting this together. We see, of course, Jesus. He's in the spotlight as the righteous one. We also see the Jewish leadership who are bringing charges against Jesus. We see false witnesses who are playing into the case as well, the high priest, and then of course the apostles, the 11 who are left, and then Judas comes back into play. So we have all these different characters at play in this particular episode of Mark's gospel. As we consider what's going on here, I wanted to take us through this chunk of text by examining the way in which they reflect an earlier passage in Mark's gospel, which is the parable of the seed and the different types of soil. So we're going to look at this section of Mark chapter 14, verses 42 through 72, in light of Jesus' earlier teaching, which we find in Mark's gospel, chapter 4. So we're going to read Mark 4, we're going to read verses 16 through 20, and then we'll flip over to Mark chapter 14 and pick up the story as it's laid out there. If you're able, I would ask you to please stand now for the reading of God's word. Once again, we're beginning in Mark chapter 4 with verse 14 and reading through verse 20. Jesus spoke to his disciples as follows. The sower sows the word. 
And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. That's the first type. The second type. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution comes on account of the word, immediately they fall away. The third type. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And the final type, fourth type. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Now, with these four types of soil, let's turn over to Mark chapter 14. We're going to read verses 42 through the end of the chapter. Follow along with me in your copy of God's Word if you're able. The Lord Jesus said, Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant to the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. 
And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is God's word for God's people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you please pray with me? Almighty and most merciful God, this is your word about your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come to you today, we ask that you would take this word. Would you please amend the soil of our hearts that this good word about your servant Jesus would find a good place in our heart, that it might germinate in our hearts and that it might grow up and bear fruit for you, for your kingdom, for your glory for your exaltation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the way in which you endured such unrighteousness at the hands of men. Help us to see ourselves in this story. Have mercy upon us. We ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus for his sake. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Right now, I'm enjoying walking around the yard at our house, trying to remember the names of the things we've planted in the yard. Some things I can remember and other things I can't. I'm thankful for my children who can remind me often of the things that we've planted, their names, etc. Now, I'm trying to remember this because when they're just sprouts, you can't necessarily tell what you've got. For instance, if you were to look at a sprout, something like this, you would see that it has a couple of leaves here and not much else. And identifying this particular sprout, as you can see, uh, would be pretty difficult. I don't know if it's a squash, it could be a zucchini squash, it could be a watermelon, it could be a pumpkin, it could be an acorn squash, a butternut squash, it could be any number of things, and I don't have any clue what it is like at this point. I don't know what sort of plant it's going to grow up to be. It knows, but it won't talk to me, unfortunately, so I have to wait for it to grow, and I have to wait for this particular sprout to bear fruit. It probably won't because when I pulled it up, I think I pulled the roots off. But there, there were others right next to it, and I'll see what they turn out to be. This is the way it is with a lot of different plants, whether you're gardening or whether you're raising flowers. Uh, some plants are more distinctive than others, but when they're very small, it's very difficult to tell what sort of plant you have. It's very easy to mistake one type for another. And so we find what is true in the natural world is also true in the spiritual world, as Jesus told us about it there in Mark chapter 4. He said that you will know what a sort of a person 
what sort of person someone is by the fruit that they bear. Jesus further helps us by telling us that the seed may grow up on various types of soil and that the fruit it bears will tell you something of the soil in which it sprang up. There are these different types of soil mentioned there in this section of text back there in Mark chapter 4. And we're going to go through our text now and look at the various characters and the drama and how it plays out in terms of these different types of soil and the people who are involved. There are four kinds of people uh, and four different types of soil. So let's look now at our text. First, let's look at the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership can be likened to the seed sown on the path. That's the first type of soil. They have heard Jesus' teaching. They've been present with Jesus through his ministry from the very first. They've heard his teaching since his ministry began. And yet, hearing the words of Jesus, those words go in one ear and out the other. They do not stay. They do not find a place to grow. Jesus' words will find no root in their hearts. When a person hears Jesus' words, they hear words of life, words that give life. But if those life-giving words find no resting place, the person remains dead in their sins. The Jewish leaders reveal that they, for the most part, remain dead in their sins. There are some of the Jewish leaders who do come around, uh, leaders like Nicodemus, for instance, who helps to bury Jesus, as we learn in another gospel. Nevertheless, for the most part, these Jewish leaders are dead in their sins. And that person dead in their sins will hate Jesus in one way or another. And this leadership hates Jesus, hate him so much that they want him dead. Another aspect of their natural bent toward sin is we see that they're cowardice. Now, Jesus calls out their cowardice back in verses 48 and 49. Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple, teaching and preaching, etc. Jesus is saying, Look, you had plenty of opportunities to arrest me, but why didn't you do it then? He's pointing out their cowardice, once again, not to show them that he is unforgiving or that he's refusing to forgive a, or to uh, let go of a grudge. He's showing them so that they might see themselves and recognize that the soil of their hearts needed amendment. They needed change from the inside out. And Jesus is trying to show them that by reminding them of their cowardice. Their cowardice is there because they fear what other people think more than they fear what God thinks and what God has said. And so they come to arrest Jesus at night in the dark when secrecy is available. That's the first type of soil. The seed has been sown on the path, but it will not germinate or find a place to root. The second type is what we see in Judas, the seed being choked out by the thorns. This is the third type of soil in that particular section of Mark. Judas has turned his back on Jesus. He's like this seed sown among thorns. He's heard Jesus' words. He's heard so much about Jesus. He's been with Jesus now for almost three years, participating in ministry, going out as an ambassador, as a missionary, seeing mighty works being done. He has participated with Jesus. He's been there at Jesus' last supper. He has experienced so many great things with Jesus, but yet that seed has been choked out. He's heard Jesus' words, but those words have been choked out by the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. Judas was a thief, John chapter 12 and verse 6 tells us. And being a thief, Jesus 
would Jesus' words would not find root. That desire for riches, that desire for wealth has choked out the seed of Jesus' word. I believe that Judas saw this whole discipleship thing was not going to yield the power or the money that he desired and hoped. And so he tries to get what he can out of a bad situation. Rather than taking his disappointments, his lemons as it were, to Jesus, he tries to make the lemonade himself. And so he hatches a scheme to get what he feels like he's been missing out on, namely money. He hatches this scheme and the Jewish leadership is only more than happy to accommodate his desires here. And he ends up making about $8,000 in modern terms uh, out of the deal, blood money for Jesus. The problem is that Judas does not see that money is deceitful. Riches always are deceitful. Many people believe and Judas believe that the solution to their problem can be bought. No matter how small, covetousness can destroy and it would destroy Judas. We also see him betraying the Lord the Savior with a kiss. It seems that Judas must be filled with anger or contempt for Jesus. How Judas repays Jesus' kindness over and over. Jesus' kindness to Judas is repaid by this betrayal. This is the way of natural man. One commentator put it this way, Judas illustrates that someone may seem like a member of a group, that is the disciples, but yet not actually be a member of that group. Judas is not truly of the disciples. Now let's move on to them. How do the disciples fare in this particular episode? They are not the only cowards in this. They also display their cowardice. No matter how much they've said, no matter how much they have protested, they all run away. Even Peter, and then this odd reference, or what may seem odd there in verses 51 and 52, about this young man fleeing, who was seized by the Romans, this one man, one young man, but he chooses to run away and leave his linen garments behind. Um, Many commentators speculate that this is a self-reference of Mark. Mark is referring to himself here. We can't know if that's actually the case at this point, this side of heaven, but it seems like a reasonable explanation. The rest of the disciples run away. It seems that Peter followed at a distance That's what the text says. However, as Peter has run away, now he's come back. He's had a quick change of heart, it seems, but he's not with Jesus. He's following at some distance. There's some removal between Jesus and Peter. These disciples are like the seed sown on rocky ground. They have received the word with immediate joy. They've rejoiced. In Christ, they have rejoiced in his friendship, in his companionship. They have treasured his words. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, back there in John chapter 6, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so they recognize the preciousness of Jesus' friendship, of his instruction, of his words. And yet, even receiving the word with immediate joy, they fell away when tribulation and persecution came. Big words, for sure, but their actions were contrary. Judas comes along with the guards and other members of the Jewish elite, and those 11 disciples fled along with this young man. Peter, too, is... This seed sown on rocky ground. Peter had already run away, but here we find that he had steeled his nerves 
and follow Jesus to a position right outside of the court. So Jesus was on an upper level there in the, uh, in the chambers being interrogated. Peter is in a courtyard down on a lower level. And so Peter was within earshot, perhaps, of what was going on upstairs. But there in the courtyard, as Peter is providing for himself, warming himself, Peter meets his dread foe, the servant girl. I say that with some sarcasm. This servant girl, the lowest of the low, just a small girl perhaps, we don't know how old she was, but this servant girl intimidated brave, big, bold Peter into denying his Lord. The flesh indeed is of no avail. Willpower will not succeed. And then the last verse in the chapter, the crowing of the rooster. Before the rooster crows twice, Jesus had told Peter, you will deny me three times. And Peter heard that rooster crowing and he broke down and wept. All of his protest, all of his bluster, had broken down. Even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will not leave is now, it's only there now as a mocking reminder of his failure. And lest we be puffed up with pride ourselves, how many of us haven't had the same experience if to a somewhat lesser degree? Jesus, just yesterday, or whenever I told you that things were going to change, well, they haven't. I remember what I said, and Satan is using it to mock me. Well, what's the point then? Jesus' courage and the disciples' cowardice reveal humanity's need for a perfect substitute, a perfect Savior. One philosopher said, human resolve is like skipping stones. You've had this experience I imagine lots of you have spent time skipping stones at a creek or a, a river or even at a lake. You've kneeled down and you, and you let them rip and, and whoever's there with you, you can count. Well, I got up to 13. I got 14. Well, we know that all stones sink. All stones sink. Human resolve always fails. And as Peter is out in the courtyard denying the Lord, Jesus is inside in the court, standing his ground, speaking the truth which will lead to his death. The truth that we saw illustrated back there in Psalm 15 at the beginning of the worship service. The one who swears to his own hurt and does not change, that's Jesus. He stands his ground. He speaks the truth, even when he realized that that truth is going to lead to his own death, his own crucifixion. Jesus is the seed sown on good soil who will bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We can't even imagine how many fold the fruit that Jesus is even bearing today. We see Jesus being falsely accused. We find the leaders there and these false witnesses. And Mark very plainly states that they bore false witness in verses 56 and 57, and that their testimony did not even agree among themselves. Some of you may remember Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson's uh, wife died this week. Uh, Chuck Colson is, uh, was the leader of uh, or one of the leaders in the Watergate scandal in President Nixon's day, and Chuck Colson was converted by this sort of evidence. He recognized that in that Watergate uh, episode, he said all of us had sworn to seek, sworn ourselves to secrecy. How many ever there were? I can't remember how many there were. We had all sworn ourselves to secrecy. But we couldn't even keep a secret for two weeks. We folded one by one, one after the other, we folded. And that was a proof to Chuck Colson 
that if something is truly a lie, you can't get people to agree and they can't keep that secret together. And so here in Mark's gospel, we find these witnesses not even being able to agree with each other. All of them are lying, but even their lies don't agree with each other. So the council could not find a substantial reason to put Jesus to death. And therefore, Jesus doesn't make a reply. He doesn't need to make a reply. He makes no reply, and he, in so doing, he fulfills Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. As a sheep before the slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. He's also wisely applying Proverbs 26 and verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. And so Jesus refuses to give an answer because these witnesses refute themselves. He doesn't need to refute them. It's perfectly obvious that they're liars. Jesus, in contrast, makes a, the good confession. The high priest Hearing all these false witnesses who are arrayed around Jesus, hearing all these false witnesses, the high priest nevertheless casts his gaze to Jesus and asks him, have you no answer to make? Answer their charges is what he wants them to do. In order to kill Jesus, they have to convict him of a capital offense. But they can't do that. And therefore, they are at odds even with themselves. These men who have memorized the law, they have tried to embody the law, they have thrown the law to the wind so that they can kill Jesus. The high priest therefore asks Jesus another question. Are you the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. This is a question worth answering, apparently. And so Jesus tells him, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a reference to an Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus, note, is the only one who's speaking the truth at this trial. The false witnesses aren't speaking the truth. The chief priest isn't speaking the truth. No one is speaking the truth except for Jesus. And here, here he speaks the truth about himself. Is he admitting his guilt? Well, I don't know about that, but he is certainly admitting the truth. And that truth also happens to be what they want to hear. Perhaps they haven't been asking the right questions. Jesus waits for the right question and gives his answer. This is a clear claim to be God. And rather than examine the evidence, the Jewish leadership conclude Jesus to be a blasphemer. Rather than saying, okay, well, we've got all these false witnesses, they don't agree, we ought to reject their testimony. We ought to actually look at the evidence. What does the evidence say about this man? He's done mighty deeds. The public knows about it. He's spoken words which are true and right. He's never broken the law. He must be the Messiah. Rather than do that, they have to conclude something else because their hearts have already been set on killing Jesus. We saw that all the way back in Mark chapter 3. They set their sights on killing Jesus, and now they are planning to have their way. And so they all condemned him as deserving death. They completely ignore the eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses, and the testimony given about Jesus because they had declared Jesus guilty two years before or three years before. And so the humiliation begins, spitting on Jesus, covering the face of the prophet and hitting him. And this was from the religious leadership. And then the guards, the Roman guards or the Jewish guards received him with blows. 
Jesus is the only example of the seed sown on good soil. He hears the words of his father, thy will be done, is his submission to it. He accepts those and accepts those words and shows that acceptance by obeying them. And he will indeed bear much fruit. He is the only truly good seed. John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The fruit that he bore is the salvation of all those who trust in him. That fruit that he bore bears many more seeds. And so we see Jesus, the perfectly righteous one, who displays perfect courage in the face of his own torture and death. He speaks the truth, even when he knows that doing so will not help him. Not only will it not help him, but speaking the truth will, in fact, lead to his torture and death. Now, the point of analyzing the passage in terms of these four kinds of soils is twofold. Number one, to show that Jesus is the only good seed. And secondly, to show that all of us are here represented as one type of seed or another. So, with whom do you identify? Which sort of soil are you? Perhaps you're like the seed which fell on the path. And that's exemplified by the Jewish leaders. No one wants to be like these guys. Not one of us wants to be like one of these guys. But sadly, this is most of humanity's response to Jesus. They hear Jesus' words, but such words make little to no difference for them. They might as well be listening to Big Bird or to the Buddha for all the difference it makes. Maybe you have been listening to Jesus' words sitting in church your whole life, but you've never felt like it had anything to do with you. Or perhaps you identify with the seed sown among thorns like Judas. You've heard what Jesus has to say, but quite frankly, you're too busy to deal with that right now. Or maybe you feel like you tried to follow Jesus for a little while, but it just wasn't working out the way that you thought it would. You kept sinning the way that you always did. You had less joy in your life. In short, following Jesus meant getting a raw deal. This is, surely this is not all Christianity is cracked up to be. This is not a great deal at all. Persecution, hardship. Ah, it's not really for me, so I'll turn my back on it. Maybe you don't feel like you're angry with Jesus for it, but you just kind of ignore him. Maybe you're trying to avoid him. Third, perhaps you're like the seed sown on rocky ground, like the disciples. You began your walk with Jesus well enough. You were excited about Bible study. You would pray whenever you had the chance. You felt the good feelings. You had uh, an optimistic view of the Lord, of Christians, of Christianity. You felt like this was a a very exciting thing to be a Christian. It was the best thing that had ever happened to you. But over time, maybe over a year, maybe over 10 years, maybe over 40 years, the excitement faded. Perhaps it just kind of dwindled down over time, or perhaps it was a response to the way that other people treated you when they found out you were a Christian. Your friends didn't much want to be with you anymore. The room always seemed to get very quiet when you came in. Maybe you'd bring up a point from the Bible in a conversation and a few chuckles would come out. Or maybe you got blasted in a science class for believing that Adam and Eve really were human beings, the first people, and were deceived and brought the whole human race into sin. Maybe some friends challenged you in the lunchroom. Well, you don't really believe all that. You know, why are you such a holy roller? Why are you such a, such a, a Jesus wannabe? And in the heat of the moment, you hmmed and 
odd and you gave up. So you just, just decided to pipe down. It's just better to be a Christian who never says anything. The good news, no matter what sort of soil you are, the soil of the pathway, the soil populated by thorns or the, the rocky ground, no matter what sort of soil you are, the good news is, is that God is the master gardener and he loves to perform, tra- to perform transplants and to amend the soil. If you feel like one of these other types of seeds, Jesus, I don't have any joy in walking with you anymore. The joy of my Christian life has faded. Maybe I never had any joy. Maybe I feel like I was doing all the right things, but you're not answering the way that I thought you would. I'm disappointed with you, God. You can say that to him. You can take your sorrows to him. He wants you to take your sorrows to him. He's tough. He can take it. But leave them there at his feet and ask him for the answers humbly, taking yourself to him, taking your soul to him. Ask him, how is it with your soul? This is a desperate question. A question in desperate need of answering. You feel like you're not the sort of soil that you want to be. You've not borne fruit the way that you feel like you should or could have. But you want to be. Talk to him about it. You could pray the prayer I've written on your sermon handout. You could pray something like it. You can ask God to change your heart. This is something that the Christian is always seeking. Change my heart. Transform my heart. Give me a new heart. Give me a clean heart. This is something we all, always ought to be doing. Asking the Lord for a clean heart, a change of heart. Remove our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. And if Jesus has given you that new birth, if you're one of the seeds of the fruit that he bore, then give him thanks and praise for the wonder of his love. And let that be the fruit of your lips this day and every day. And so we praise him. We sing his praises. We glorify him. We lift up the name of Jesus, the truly good seed, the one who has borne much fruit, that fruit that continues even now, even today, and will until Jesus returns. And so my plea is with you today to examine your hearts before the Lord to see what sort of soil you are and ask God to change your heart into the sort of soil that will bear fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, what else should we do but worship you? To tell of your excellent greatness. That's the reason that we gathered together here in the first place, and it's what keeps us together here at the end. To tell of your excellent greatness. To sing of your wondrous love. To acknowledge that you, O Lord, came and you conquered, you finished the work that the Father had given to you. You submitted to his will. You said, thy will be done, and you did it. Oh, Jesus, we praise you for the way that you persevered to the very end. You gave yourself to the uttermost for sinners like us. And Lord, none of us, not one single member of us is where we ought to be. We have all fallen short. There is none righteous save you. But yet in your grace, you took our sins to the cross and you offer us your very righteousness. A clean robe. A new heart. A spirit made right 
with the Lord God. And so, Lord, would you help us today, help us every day to remember our need for a new heart, our need for that cleansing, our need for you to amend the soil of our hearts that we might bear fruit for you, King Jesus. So we thank you. We praise you for your love. We praise you for your steadfastness, for your courage in the face of hardship and persecution of torture and in the face of death. Thank you for giving us yourself. Help us to give ourselves away to you to offer ourselves as living sacrifices for your glory and for your kingdom. All these prayers we lift in the name of Jesus to our Father, by the Spirit. Amen and amen. We're going to sing now hymn number 175. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let us sing indeed with vigor. What a great and wondrous Savior we have. Would you please stand as we sing? sorrows what a name for the son of god who came ruin sinners to reclaim hallelujah what a savior bearing shame and scoffing Condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior! Guilty, vile, and helpless, we, spotless Lamb of God, was he. Full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry, now in And if your trust today is in the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope, your righteousness, I offer you this blessing now from his word and his name. Peace be to the brothers and the sisters and love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And all God's people said, Amen.